Our guest in this segment is Patricia Rucker, Senator Patricia Rucker. Good morning to you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Uh, so uh, as we've discussed before, you're a native of Venezuela. Yes. You came to America. And there's a lot of dialects in Spanish, too. Yeah, there are. And there's, there's uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Spanish, and, and there are uh, many different divisions within those who speak the language. That's and, and, and that's spoken in many countries. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, when, you, when you came to America, uh, how fluent were you in English? None at all. Really? I mean, I was six years old. Um, so, so you were barely, barely fluent in Spanish. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. And um, so I came here without any knowledge of English at all and not even able to speak Spanish that well. Um, when I went to elementary school here in the United States, I had to not only take the ESOL classes, I had to take speech pathology classes because I had difficulty just pronouncing certain sounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still struggle with certain sounds. I still have to pause and think um, when I have to say a few words. Well, I don't want you to feel bad because Bill was born here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in the rural south. That gives, that gives me a lot of latitude. Yeah. I don't even try, Patricia. I just avoid. Do you and uh, Lala Mooney ever get together and, oh. and talk about your shared past? We do, and I love Lala. She knows that. Um, we absolutely do. And um, one day I would love to be able to follow in her footsteps and write a book. Um, not about my story, but about my parents' mm -hmm. story, because that's really the real, um, just amazing story. Both of them came from very poor families. Both of them were the first one in their family to ever go to college. Um, my mother went on to got a, get a master's and was on her way to get a PhD when we came to the United States. And just both of them are just amazing, amazing people who did amazing things. What brought your parents to the U.S.? My father was a correspondent for Agency France Press. And I'm not going to go into the whole story, oh. but he literally decided when he was like 10, 11 years old, he met some businessman that happened to go through his village and was driving a very nice car and was wearing a suit and jacket. And my father said, that's what I want. And he set off to do that even though his family wasn't for it and it seemed impossible so he became a journalist he got this job and he got transferred to Washington DC desk of agency France press and it was supposed to be just a short stint of four years but it kept being extended and by the time I was 17 years old I met my husband and I knew okay <laughs> I'm staying <laughs> yeah uh, Patricia you made a point that uh, you would not you like to write a book not about yourself but about your parents uh, that is so true with so many of us we know our grandparents we know the history of grandparents uh, we rarely know our great grandparents so as you go through each generation another uh, generation will be lost exactly. uh, my cousins and I got together about four or five years or so ago and collected all of our recollections of our grandparents and our parents and compiled it in a book which we had published That's and great. it will be for that generation will be captured otherwise it would have been lost for future generations well I'm so yeah. glad you guys yeah. did that yeah. I hope I do the same yeah uh, Damon Wright wants to know if your children can speak Spanish. So I, I'm very ashamed to admit that only two out of the five. The oldest? The oldest. Yeah. Um, very typical. I'm, uh, I'm, <laughs> I don't know what to say. So I homeschooled my children, as I'm sure you know. It was easier when it was just a few children to go Spanish to English at home. I would speak Spanish during the day, and when my husband was awake, I would switch to English. And then you have more children and you become tired <laughs> and you have so many more other things to do and the switching back and forth didn't happen as frequently so all of my children have a little bit of understanding of Spanish because they've heard it spoken by me my parents and the family but I didn't really teach the younger children as I should have my grandmother had seven the oldest ones could all speak Italian slash Sicilian but by the time I came my father was the youngest by the time I came to him it was understand but not really be able to speak too much. Exactly. You know? I will say the same thing happened to me. So I worked so hard to learn English. I kind of like just neglected the Spanish. Mm -hmm. But thankfully, my parents never stopped speaking it in our presence. So I always understood it. And when I went 
back to Venezuela, we went back every other summer and spent the whole summer there, it would just come back. Mm -hmm. I can understand a lot of what my grandmother said, but being able to speak, understanding is a lot easier than being able to speak. Exactly. Yeah. I want to go, before we move on, I want to go back sure. to this, this book thing, sort of my wheelhouse. The, I think it's really important if you, if you can do it to document as much of, of family history as you can, because it is fragile and it, it, it gets lost I think you're right. After about two generations, they get lost. And I've recently found we, we moved and you, know, you get boxes of stuff you don't know you had. And I found this trove of letters that my parents wrote to each other when my dad was in the Navy when he was out floating and I was very young. And it's, it's trivial matters. It's the daily concerns, not worthy of a book per se, but it really in, in their own handwriting. Um, what what their concerns of the time in the 1950s and, and, and 40s, for that matter. Um, and the fact that it's in their handwriting is important now with new technology to be able to record images and voices. And, and you think how valuable that would be three generations, four generations from now to actually have that direct connection. Any, if you can do it, don't worry about selling it. There's not a yeah. market for it, but it's so important to your family. It, and there are certain nuggets and jewels that you, you pick up that captures the, the attitude and the personality of your grandparents. And this particular one, I was the only one that heard the story, is my grandfather, who was a uh, cotton farmer in rural West Tennessee, no money, never had any money. They would uh, uh, borrow from the country store every uh, during the year, pay it back when the cotton came in. And one summer, uh, the, the store burned down. My grandfather, who again had very, very, very little money at any time, but had made an account of all of his bills. And they, uh, so he went to the store owner and said, I owe you this amount of money. He was the only one of the customers that did that. That speaks realms of my grandfather and the character. And that is a type of nugget that I'd like to be preserved for future generations. That's awesome. Yeah. Senator Rucker, there is an interim session coming up. Uh, I believe the governor may call a special session. Do you have any idea at this point whether he will or not? So I've heard those rumors. I have not gotten any actual detailed information, but there was an intention when we left the session that we would do a special session to handle a few issues that we didn't get to or didn't make it across the finish line. So that's consistent with what I've been hearing, which is that we are going to do something, but I haven't gotten any details yet. Any idea what the topics might be? Speculation? Well, one of those bills that didn't make it through that all of us legislators are deeply concerned about is uh, salary for correctional mm -hmm. officers. Um, the crisis in the jail, I think the media has covered pretty well. Um, so I'm fairly certain if we have a special session, that's going to be on the call. What about these uh, fire department bills that are being discussed, Patricia, EMS bills, in terms of funding the various fire stations around the state and the method by which that'll be calculated and then ultimately distributed? That's another one that we've been talking about a lot. But again, I have not seen or heard any particular um, bills, so it's hard for me to say. I know that the Joint Committee on Fire and Ambulance is meeting on Sunday of the interim session, so we have our agenda out. You can find it on westvirginialegislature.gov, but I looked ahead of this um, meeting today and no agendas are actually posted, so there you go. Sorry. Billy? Uh, yeah, uh, DHHR. We a lot of we heard a lot about it last year. It's been split into three different parts. Has that is that the solution, or is that just made tracking of the problem more difficult? So our intention, at least, is to make tracking of the problem easier. So if you have three separate departments, and one is child and family welfare, and one is the social services, and one is the facilities. When we have a concern, a problem, an issue, something is not getting addressed, we can more easily go directly to the person who's in charge of that particular field house. And the idea was, it's such a huge agency to, I mean, if you just think about one agency being in charge of all of those different things and the just hundreds of different um, services that they provide, it really is overwhelming for like one director to really be on top of it all. So 
this way we have three separate excellent we hope <laughs> but they have not been hired yet have they they, they have All at least three? two okay. out of the three are hired i i am not completely yeah. certain about the third but two out of the three and really really the idea is to have a much more streamlined efficient organization you're in charge of this and we expect you to get this done well and i i'm hopeful that it will work who has oversight? Governor's office, the legislators, so, or who? DHHR is under the governor's office, but obviously the legislature, you know, funds everything. Fun, but again, the key is oversight. Exactly. And how much will you actually be involved in the oversight aspect of it? So um, I can only speak about myself. Sure. That's I right. definitely have a reputation for being very um, much on top of the agencies. I read the rules I check on them I see that they're actually doing what they're supposed to do I have a very much person-to-person -person, face to face contact with the agency heads and I plan to continue that especially in the one area of child welfare so that's one of the areas that I'm most concerned about and has always been a priority for me and that's the one that's received most visibility uh, is that the one that's going to be most most difficult to correct Yes, because we're dealing with very difficult um, areas of What life. are we correcting? So when it comes to the government's role in helping families, um, the only reason for why we have these agencies is when things go wrong, right? If things never go wrong, you do not have an experience with these agencies. So we're talking about when um, the parents are neglecting or abusing their children or um, a, so sometimes it's adult neglect, right? They're abusing their senior citizen, you know, grandparent, somebody's being neglected or abused. We're talking about um, situations where people are very poor, don't have enough resources to take care of themselves, take care of their family members. We're talking about lack of home, homeless, um, just all the bad stuff that could happen. Um, and that agency is in charge of those services. And we have been pushing for the last seven years that I've been there, and I'm very proud that it has been something I have been right on the foreline of getting right, to reform it. Because the reputation in West Virginia has not been very great when it comes to this area. Um, we have the highest amount of foster care children under state custody of any state in the United States, and even though we are one of the smallest states. Is that because of substance abuse issues for the most part? That is a big, big driver. I also believe that for too long, our um, child welfare services were, um, their priority was to remove the child versus trying to fix the family. Um, so with the help of my fellow legislators, of course, we have passed three or four major reform of the bills. And one of those bills is changing that where we first try to support the families and keep the families together, and that becomes our priority versus immediately, let's just remove the child and put them through the system. So I'm hoping that that only passed two years ago, so it's, it's in the early stages. And then as you guys know, just having the workers to do the work has been a huge, huge problem for us. We've increased their salaries. We, it is one of the first areas we have done any kind of locality pay where we finally have higher pay for the CPS workers in certain areas. Um, we're hoping that's gonna make a difference, but it's always been a problem. But that's been the key, one of the key problems, not having adequate workers. Uh, Senator Trump was able to highlight this along with others as well. So you've increased the pay. Have you been able to do an aggressive, effective recruitment to add additional workers? So obviously getting the reorganization done had to be done first. And it is now the job of the new head of that agency to now be pushing forward. The law- Do they have a resource? Does the new head have resources to do yes, this? Yes, they definitely have the resources. And I can tell you, so what we passed in the session becomes law July 1st. So we're talking about literally has had this one month to begin with, with those resources. Mm -hmm. Patricia Rucker, our guest, uh, Senator in the 16th. Go ahead, John. You said that of the, the there are three 
uh, agency heads to be hired. Two of them have. Which two have been hired and which remains unhired? Shoot, you're going to ask me that question. <clears throat> I don't, I'm not going to ask you for the names necessarily, but which of the agencies? Do you? I, I cannot remember right okay, now off the fine. top of my head. I'm sorry. Yeah. I even re One of them is Dr. Persily, but I can't even remember which agency she's on top of. Sorry. And are these targeted to be hired from within, so agency knowledge comes along with it or are these outside searches to, to so find I the heads of departments? So I think they looked everywhere, but obviously, you know, the people that we know within West Virginia to be excellent administrators, I believe that the governor's focus was to, you know, kind of find yeah. those folks. Yeah. And um, you've done an excellent job with this agency, help us with this. And we gave them really good incentive packages because we wanna, we wanted them particularly for these positions. We want the best of the best. Senator if I can shift to the upcoming election, and obviously uh, Paul Espinoza is, has, is be running against you. Uh, a lot of this is going to come back to come down to money, and any campaign requires money. Uh, do you, how do you compare, not necessarily the, uh, the, the facts, how do you consider your, compare your money coming in to that of Paul's? Well, I will be honest that I don't. Okay, <laughs> I do not compare. That's okay. not how I think. Um, but in terms of funding, I've always had, um, I guess you say, grassroots campaigning mm -hmm. and grassroots fundraising. And most of my donations have always come from individuals giving me 20, 50, 100, sometimes $500. Um, and I've done okay. I will say that um, I somehow have managed to gain mm -hmm. national attention. So I do receive some money also from all over the United States, folks who like the work that I've done and appreciate the leadership I've shown in West Virginia, which has bled through to other states now. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll get a little bit of, of those kind of funds also. Okay, do you get PAC dollars at all? That may be what you're talking about. You get some PAC dollars? I, I assume I'll get some. Okay. I, I've ne that's never been the biggest part of my yeah, campaign okay. fundraising. You, uh, you, you take great pride, and I think justifiably so, that you do a lot of door knocking. And you, uh, you, you uh, uh, kind of emphasize this. At the end of a campaign, what percent of the resident homes have you knocked on the door? Is it 25%, 50%? Just a rough so guess. So obviously the first time I ran, um, mm -hmm. I did a lot more doors because yeah. I could okay. do it essentially as a job. But now that I have been serving as a senator, I can't do it quite as much as I did because I am so very busy doing the work of yeah. senator. But in 2020, I probably hit, I would say, about maybe 10% of the doors That's in my district. Number, yeah. It okay. is. Yeah. And um, I, it's not so much that I take pride in it. I love it. It is literally one of the things I love about my job is just getting to meet voters and getting to hear directly from them and getting to help them when I hear that mm -hmm. they're having an issue. Well, hey, I know the right person to call to help you with that issue. It's just, it's the most rewarding part of the work. Senator Rucker, is the future of West Virginia politics, let's say over the next 10 years or whatever, what we're seeing now with no real opposition party, it effectively will be Republicans cannibalizing other Republicans in the primaries? <laughs> I sure hope not. <laughs> I will tell you that um, I've been talking with legislators from all over the c country um, from that have red states and have been red states for much longer than West Virginia. And what we're experiencing is very common. Um, they tell me this is exactly what, you know, happens in their very solid red states, that the competition really becomes through the primary. And there's this constant battle between you know us one side versus the other but at the end of the day my hope is we stay focused on solving the problems the state has and helping people instead of worrying about um how we get there i mean how we get there is matters but when you look deep down to the disagreements between sides a lot of it is well we just want to do it this way instead of that way and can we just say okay can, let's just get there mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I will tell you as you know I ran against the Senate president last year and it was because I just felt there's more ways to get there do you regret that I'm not at all do you feel like you're suffering any repercussions from it? 
Well, to be fair, I do believe that um, it is, to a large extent, a uh, reason for why I've been removed from committees. But um, I never, ever ran in order to be chair of a committee. I never ran in order to be popular with my colleagues. I ran because I wanted to help the people in my district. Do you think you would have been primaried had you not run against the Senate president? Impossible to know. You'll have to ask somebody else. <laughs> Mr. Stubblefield. Yeah, that's, that's fair. Uh, and I had a question, and I and Rob took so, it away from me. Well, I I'll go what ahead. it was. <laughs> go ahead, John. They say that all politics are local, and we tend on this show to talk about um, the systemic issues uh, with, within the state, child care, welfare, and all that, and, and DHHS. The phone calls you get about really local concerns what category do they fall into do you get the pothole calls and, and that sort of thing or what what are, what are the concerns yes. of of john q citizen in their daily life i will tell you that i received more phone calls about education than anything else um folks um have about what's happening at particular school or? yes okay particular issues with their school with their child with their education, what they're experiencing. Um, that's probably my number one calls. And then I do get the potholes um, calls, traffic lights, complaints. Um, folks call for because of broadband and being upset they don't Speaking have Speaking of which. I know, I know. <laughs> Listen, yeah. I'm in it. I'm in a dead zone that is so frustrating. Mm -hmm. And folks um, all around the country, like they keep thinking like we've solved this issue. Yeah, no. We're a long way from solving the issue. Yeah. Your answer to a question earlier implied that that you wish we had a more robust Democratic Party. Do you think this, uh, maybe I misinterpreted that, uh, <laughs> do you think the state is being well served with a super majority of a party, of one party? So obviously it's great that, um, you know, we have the ability to set the agenda and to run things, and I think that that's really important. But I never had any issues working with Democrats across the aisle, even the ones that are as far away from me, you know, ideology, ideologically as, as can be, because they bring something to the table, they add to the conversation, and it's always been my intent to find ways to get the best possible solutions for everyone and you get that with diversity of opinion mm -hmm. so i don't really feel, i don't feel like i was saying oh we should have a robust yeah. democratic yeah. Mm -hmm. i'm but i do believe that it is good and healthy to have discussion to have open dialogue and to not just uh be in an echo chamber yeah i guess the question would be are we better served with a super majority as opposed to majority so again, I think they both have yeah. pros and cons. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. I, I don't, I'm not trying to avoid answering your question, yeah, yeah. but they just have, um, each of them has well, their Well, the Republican Party in, in West Virginia is anything but monolithic. It's, it's like there's at least two you, different parties you, within you, the Republican Party. You're exactly party, right, so. yes. Mm -hmm. They and call it the three. grand old party for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Senator Rucker, just about out of time, anything that our audience needs to know about in regards to the state's business? Well, that we uh, haven't covered. Uh, it's I'm not the, real quick that I can think of, but I do want to let folks know. So next week is interims. Anyone can listen in to the committees. They are all um, live streamed and um, on the WV legislature website. And I really, really ask, be involved, listen in, call, email, you know, whatever, because we're there to represent you. And it's in the joint interim committee meetings that we really set the agenda for upcoming sessions so if there's something you're particularly concerned about now's the time to get it to us uh we are at uh, tomorrow's august 1st so school starts soon anything parents need to know about the hope scholarship this year well the yes sure the um the application is passed so most of the people who are going to apply for hope scholarship have already done so folks are going to get receive their first checks august 15th if they've been accepted and approved and i can tell you that we are working on streamlining it there is still a plan to do a hope scholarship cleanup bill in the next session all right next question is did you pay half your property personal property tax in <laughs> advance or all of it in advance i just paid for half 
All right. Remember, that's the message this year. Just pay for half. Senator Rucker, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you. Thanks. Jim. Always good to visit with you. 933.